Live from Peep's Luncheonette, this is Derailed Trains of Thought. Hi, Tim. Hello, Nick. Hey, we get food again. Yay, yeah. The podcast keeps bringing us to some places where we'll uh, get fed. Yeah, though, a little strange people here. Well, it is... The oh, people? Well, yeah. I'm pretty sure I saw a frog that was uh, working in the kitchen in the back. Okay, okay. I, I, I and we've seen weirder. And there's some... These uh, waiters are awfully small and furry. Hmm. If I was more health conscious, I would be very concerned. Yeah, but as long as, as, long as they get it quick and... I mean, quick you go to a greasy spoon like this, this is what you expect. Yeah, yeah, so... We'll order some after we're done here. Okay. Yeah. May I get a coffee for the for the podcast? Well, although I do note uh, here on the menu that uh, the spoon is free. So if, no. you, if you get soup, the spoon comes with it. So that's nice. That's really nice. Yeah. I'm yeah. Not, nowadays, they're trying to get nickel diamond and sell free spoons. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, pretty good. Anyways, welcome, Tim. <laughs> well, welcome. <laughs> Why are you welcoming me? You mean- well, uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, Darrell Train the Thought. Your premier podcast on storytelling. For the creator and the consumer. Oh, you had to, you, had, you could finish it off. Okay. <laughs> well, I was letting you do it. Okay. Anyways. I was sharing the intro with you, Nick. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> anyways, I am Nick, one of your hosts. And I am Timothy Deal, your other host. And welcome to this podcast. So how's life been, Tim, before this greasy spoon? You know, as summer it keeps trucking along. This will probably come out toward the end of July, but we're in mid-July right now, and it seems plenty busy at the moment. Yes. Uh, there's always fun summer activities to do, and your schedule will fill up before you realize it, and it's like, oh, well, I guess I won't get to do that in time. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> but uh, that's okay. I'm sure you're feeling even more of that. Well, yeah, we had a vacation last week, which was very nice. Kind of a week off, and the next week we go to youth conference. Oh, next so, week is youth conference. Yes. So that's that's my July, and then when I get back, I got about a week, and then it's teacher meetings. Yay. Yay. <laughs> School is less than a month away. Only... Uh, 60 some days of summer vacation. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Phoenix and Ferb had, had a better deal than we did. Yeah, they did. I feel like that number must have been inspired from the 60s or something. Or some, yeah, I don't know. Maybe other states. I mean, I know Michigan starts later than we do and mm. et cetera. But anyways, we're not here to talk about education reform. We're here to talk about storytelling. So let's get to story school. Well, actually, I'm going to have Tim introduce this, since this was his his brainchild. Ah, uh, my child of my brain. Yes. As someone mm, I know as terminology has come up with. So th- this is sort of a amalgamation of some previous topics. In episode 57, I believe it was. Oh, we, very nice. I was looking this up this uh, this afternoon. Oh, no, you just have to say you know it off the top of your head. I know all of our episodes like the back of my hand. Nice. Which has a lot of wrinkles and stuff. I don't actually know how I would describe mole, the back of my right, hand. Mole, see right there. Well, that's, yeah. that's, I know that's on Gonzo's back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we're well, we're unhinged tonight. Uh, so episode 57, we talked about uh, stories that have a message, which really all art has a message of some sort. But when it gets heavy handed. But when it gets heavy handed. What we were ex- examining. Yes, is what we were looking at. And on a slightly different note, in episode 84. 487, I don't have this in front of me right oh, wow. now. I thought you knew it like the back of your head. And I'm not, apparently not. Okay. I think it was actually 84 because the other one's 57. So anyway, episode 84, we talked about simple versus complex plots. Plots, yes. Yes. So we're going to kind of combine these things and let's talk about simple morals or simple messages. Messages. In a story. But yeah, I guess what you were telling me is that two different shows going to have the same sort of message, but one comes off like, oh, that meaningful to me because it's, I mean, it's simple. It's like just direct, but... But true. But true. And other times, kind of almost the same thing, kind of direct and just sort of like cheesy or maudlin or yeah, um, feel you know you just like oh, okay, everyone says that. It yeah. doesn't mean anything. It's kind of the difference between the simple versus like a simplistic. Yes, simple like it's something simple. It's like oh, that's wholesome. That's I understand that. I appreciate. It. It's like oh, it's just two bros having a good time. And it is a true and it's a truth that like it just sinks in because oh, it's so simple. You know, <laughs> it's like a cat poster. <laughs> um, the Lego movie. Yeah. Quote. What, what's the thing? It's it's uh. It seems simple, but it's true. Something like that. Yeah. 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 Versus the simplicity, like okay, really, that's so cliche. And or... I guess just to bring up the Lego movie, it somehow threads that. You know, it has this sort of hanging there, sort of your special sort of message, but it works. 
Yeah. And it really should. <laughs> and a lot of other shows, you're like, well, yeah, of course. Blah, blah, blah. But that show, you're like, it's heartfelt. It's Yeah. And it's interesting, the, the sequel movie, the Lego Movie 2, I think it was called, kind of was like, okay, well, and, and first one was like, everything is awesome. And the yeah. second one was like, everything is not awesome. And, yeah. and it didn't... It, it didn't really seem like it undercut the first movie, it, like significantly. Just like, okay, yeah, some the first one was like, oh, what, life is wonderful, but the second one was like, okay, but you know, we know that sometimes things go bad, and um, we'll work around that. Although, interestingly enough, I don't think the second one is nearly remembered nearly as much. Even though I don't think people had ill will against no, it. No, I think we're not fine. It just the first one was just so fresh, fresh, and out of the blue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, that's sidetrack. Anyways, you had another example of this dichotomy. Yeah, I think I first was thinking about this topic after I was listening to a Muppet podcast called Moving Right Along, which they go through the Muppets movie, each Muppet movie, uh, like two minutes at a time each episode, and they talk about it a lot, (laughs) which is what they say. They recently finished uh, the Muppet Christmas Carol. Oh man, good movie. Yeah, great movie. A lot of fun. But this idea actually came from when they were talking about the Muppets Take Manhattan. And it was interesting to me that the hosts talked about how much they enjoyed the song at the end of the movie called He'll Make Me Happy. Yeah. Which, if you've never seen Muppets Take Manhattan, it's all about the Muppets trying to sell a Broadway play mm-hmm. musical. Don't try to put it in canon with the Muppet show because it doesn't fit. It's just... It's just a story. It's just a story. and Just um, relax. Yeah. <laughs> at the end of the movie, they put on their play, and the last song is He'll Make Me Happy, and it's a scene where Miss Piggy and Kermit are getting married. Is it real? Is it canon? There is no Muppet canon. I just said that. Um, but it's <laughs> the one Gonzo comes out of. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Anyway, the host was one of the hosts was saying how much he loved the song and how apparently he himself played this at his wedding. And I've always found the song kind of sappy, to be yeah. honest. I mean, and this is coming from a hardcore Muppet fan yeah. because some of the lyrics are talking like they're Kermit and Piggy are singing this as they're walking down the aisle, basically, and they're all about uh, he'll make me happy. That's all I need to know. Each time I hold her, da 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 da, our love will grow and all this stuff. But the, again, that kind of the final line of that is, but all I know is he'll make me happy. That's all I need to know. And like, there's actually a lot more to a marriage that you probably do need to know, particularly about your marriage partner. Yes. I mean, even before I got married, I knew this was the case and I always thought the song was a little. A little sappy because of it. But then that got me to thinking, there are other Muppet songs that I find very meaningful, in particular, The Rainbow Connection. Yes. Because that's a song from the Muppet movie that Kermit sings. It's all about this kind of longing for something that you don't know what it is Mm -hmm. and this kind of creative spark. Although even the song itself is not necessarily about creativity, although the movie is about, you know, wanting to sing and dance, make people happy. Yeah, but the, the song is a little broader than that. It, the song is a little broader than that, which I've always found fascinating. It's a, the Broadway term for it is the I want song. Okay. Yeah. But in this case, I feel like it's almost more of a, I long song. Like I'm looking for something. Yeah. Not certain what it is. Santa Fe. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a whole, it's a whole thing. You know, Bell sings about it in yeah. Beauty and the Beast. But in, in Kermit's case, and the song is written by Paul Williams, who I think is constantly searching for spiritual things. This song really has a spiritual vibe to it. I think that some of the inspiration was like this was going to be Kermit's "If You Wish Upon a Star." Yeah, and it kind of feels that. But I don't know the the lyrics for it feel more spiritual than just. The wish, wishiness of wishing upon a star. Yeah. Is this the sweet song that calls the young sailor? The voice might be one and the same. I've heard it too many times to ignore it. It's something that I'm supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And I remember this resonated with me a lot in high school. Yeah. This kind of longing for something. And as a Christian, I put a Christian perspective yeah. on that. Like mm-hmm. God is calling us even when we don't really know his voice or, you know, I mean, I knew his voice or and that sounds really pretentious, but, you know, <laughs> as Christians, we do yeah. feel like we get to know God in a way. Mm-hmm. And I think Christians definitely believe in a sort of a longing for something. But on the surface, some of those like, why are there so many songs about rainbows and what's on the other side? I can see how someone could, could accuse that of being like very basic. But yeah. so why does that, why does Rainbow Connection hit, hit me on a deeper level, whereas something like He'll Make Me Happy doesn't? Now, here's a question. I don't think it stays here, but I think maybe a starting point is that the obviously the artistry behind it we'll get to, but how much of that you think depends on the person receiving it? I think there is a fair amount of that. 
personal taste has a big factor into how whether you perceive something as simple or meaningful. When, when, I think I was thinking maybe more than personal taste, this idea like you're talking about the longing song and the he'll make me happy is a different sort of longing. I, I mean, but I mean, but it depends what your view of marriage, you know, if you're a little more like, no, like this is hard work, then yeah. you're like, this is not going to cut it. But I wonder if even some of the, you know, the simplistic stories about like, Friends will help you or whatever. You know, it's always mm. interesting. You always find someone like, oh, that real that really connected with me. And you're like, really? Like that's <laughs> super like basic or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if it's if we are more susceptible to find deep, simple meaning in things that we are desperately looking for. Mm. I don't know that again, there's a there's obviously our I think we'll get to the point that there's artistic choices that help. Yeah. But I wonder how much of the that we are looking for stories that resonate with what we don't have. I think that's a fair that's a fair point. To go to another fandom of mine mm-hmm. in Kingdom Hearts, those are f- very simple games in the sense of like the power of friendship the, and, the, and the close... themes are simple, the the plot is not. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. That being said, when I played the first DS game, which has a ridiculous title, but so I'll just abbreviate it to 358 days. Um <laughs> I won't try to explain the rest of the title, but I remember feeling that like, okay, this has gone way too emo for my taste. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, yeah. it's a very depressing game. The main character is kind of working for an organization who is actually the bad guys, although he doesn't know that because of his circumstances and mm-hmm. he feels very isolated the whole time. And there's a character that, you know, is not going to survive through the end of the game because <laughs> this is sort of a mid cool and she wasn't there in the, in, in kingdom hearts too. So, so like, like, oh. like, okay, well, I can see where you're going with this. You're, you're trying to pull a tragedy card and like, this doesn't work for me. Yeah. But it's actually a very beloved game with other fans of the franchise hmm. And I highly suspect how you feel about that game depends partly on on what age you come to it. Okay. I mean, I played it fresh out of college. The I mean, I played the first games out of college, and they're fun and simple, but like they felt nostalgic to me. Yeah. This one felt like much more like teenage angst. And oh, I'm like, okay. I'm so over this kind of thing. Yeah. I, I don't care. But I could see how some who, if someone played it who was just beginning teenage angst. Mm-hmm. Might have that might resonate. be much more mean. Red does resonate more, so that makes that makes some sense to me. Yeah, I do think there's a certain amount, and I think creators do this too. They the thing that they're either searching for, or longing for, or struggling with is what powers a lot of their storytelling. Like you were talking about, what's his name, Paul Williams? Paul Williams. Paul yeah. Williams and Rainbow Connection. But I think that happens with other stories generally. Yeah, and we touched on this a little bit in our messages episode yeah. where we talked about how. If you don't agree with the message that a movie is trying to put out, you might think, okay, well, that story's moral is kind of preachy or yeah. they're like, that doesn't... But if you agree with it, you're like, preach it, amen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, okay, but how, how about artistically? What do you think it separates them? Or is it, is it just, for instance, those two songs? I don't remember um, it will Make Me Happy as much, but I know Rainbow Connection had some very powerful metaphors and imagery going on Mm -hmm. it's poetic in a way is he make me happy is a little more vanilla or not well you know rainbow connection takes place at the beginning of the movie Mm -hmm. it's sort of your identifying moment and for the muppet movie it was also a very powerful moment like wow current's in the real world he's in a swamp yeah it's it's kind of there's beautiful imagery going on with he'll make me happy it's already been established that this is a play like yeah. uh, this is a story within a story. It's not the real life. So there's kind of a little bit of confusion of wait, are Kerwin and Piggy actually getting married, or is this part of the act? Okay, like it's it's meta. I, I yeah, it's meta. It's like I'm not even sure how most people would actually like. There's a little bit of a question of how invested are we supposed to be in this scene? Okay, at least for, you, at least for me. Oh, and that and that makes sense. Then then you take yourself out of the. You're not you're watching it from the outside as opposed to being sucked in. Yeah, and. I don't know. I've never really, like, I'd have to talk more with the guy who used yeah. it for his wedding who actually found it, it meaningful. Maybe there's just a simplicity and trust in the other person. But, you know, I, I was taught from fairly early on that when you're looking for a significant other, you're going to want to find something you're compatible with. But it's also, it's not just about being happy. It's about yeah. loving yeah. and being self-sacrificing that, and the, the, loving even when you're not making each the, other the happy. The happiness is uh, is a nice byproduct and not the main <laughs> goal yeah there's a lot of things that people say make them happy that won't actually in the long run and maybe just that cynicalness not cynicalness it sounds cynical from now but there's realism yeah 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 
and I can suspect on the the flip side of like not and not just being a matter of taste. I th- I do think sometimes it's a matter of the message feels incomplete in some ways. There's like okay, being happy is important, but that's not the full truth of a given situation. Yeah, and I seem like I, I say it every couple episodes, but I think some of the artisticness is how honest to real life does it feel? Mm. Does it resonate with your situation? But also, I mean, if it resonates with the situation, it resonates with real life. There's certain things that happen in stories you're just like, yeah, but that's not how it works. Yeah. Now, there might be one, again, there's still the aspirational aspect. So it's, you know, then it's also, is the world supposed to work that way or not? Mm. You know, if you like, if, would, we, if, would we like the world to work more? Yeah, like does that? the world, you know, does this message align with how we think the world works or should work? Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't, then we tend to be a little more at a distance yeah. from it. So I don't know whether we should try to pick another, move to another example. So Probably. We, we've we milked this one a fair bit. Let's go to the, the idea of the value of friendship, yeah, the yeah. power of friendship sort of thing. Sometimes that comes in a video game or a cartoon and it feels really cheesy. Other times, maybe it feels more powerful. I think maybe the, the artistic difference there is how much do you identify with the characters and, mm. and have come to care and love about them a lot. And sometimes maybe how... How directly are they hammering over the head, too? Yeah, yeah. I mean, because when you start to draw power of friendship, you never think about this, but like one of my favorite examples would be like Sam and Frodo. Okay, sure. But they're not saying, this is the meaning. It's just one of those, <laughs> it's more of a subtext. So maybe that doesn't count in our symbol versus simplistic. I mean, that's a fair point. I mean, like if the only thing that your story has going for it, what it's all coming down to is just that, as opposed to this is one ingredient of what we're exploring in our story. So what do you think? Is there a really good, it's like the main focus with friends? So for instance, I have mixed feelings about Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Okay. Yeah, that has that theme. Uh-huh. And there's a lot of, it's done pretty well for a lot of it. Mm-hmm. But some of the other stuff that happens makes it like, well, we don't care about anyone else <laughs> except our friendship. And so it's yeah. a little... But I would argue that the strength of that movie is the fact that it convincingly... You feel like they really care about each other. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes that movie work. Yeah, I can see that. And partly because you have history. Uh-huh. And partly because there is growth on all the characters. And, and there are some nice, really good emotional moments that are, seem realistic. You know, it's funny. One series that came to mind when you asked that... It's actually Naruto, the oh, anime yeah. slash manga series. Let's go with the manga because it's a little, yeah. You know, the anime has tons of filler and it gets lost all over the place. But just the core Naruto story. One thing about, particularly in the second half of the series, Naruto is desperately trying to reconcile his friend slash rival Sasuke back to the village, to his mm-hmm. village. Sasuke left the village. He's been betrayed. The village has basically cast him out because he's gone to initially to work for a villain, although really he's... He's really just trying to follow his own vengeance plan, yeah. which morphs over time who he's actually getting trying to get vengeance on because that's how vengeance works. But throughout all of the bad things that Sasuke does, Naruto never gives up on trying to bring Sasuke back. Okay. Long past the point when many readers and viewers of it would have cared about Sasuke. Okay. And he's so stubborn with it that eventually he really does like in one of their final fights to the death after having <laughs> the two do like wind up working together to defeat some other big bad basically. Yeah. But then after that, Sox like, still is trying like wants to backstab and he's got issues, <laughs> <laughs> but eventually Naruto does get through to him. like, no, I will die before I let you go. And that sort of like dedication to him finally breaks. him's like, okay, I give up. <laughs> you are <laughs> now, now readers, it sounds like you really appreciate that moral. Like, on the one hand, it's very powerful. On the other hand, like, I don't know that anyone in the audience was really caring about Sasuke any longer. The, like, it, it felt like a sort of like borderline obsessive, I will not give up on you sort of thing. Okay, uh, what I was going to ask is that, like, because, again, it's aspirational in the sense, like, we wouldn't care that much about people. But also, did it become so unrealistic that people didn't? care buy into it yeah like do do it become does it become like well it had to happen because it's been going on so long or did it become like or was it pulled off in such a way that you're like oh i didn't understand what you're going for but now i do honestly i'd say it's kind of a mix okay i definitely have seen some commenters who like no i couldn't stand this character after you know sasuke after a certain period of time and then there are gonna be other people that like no but he had certain reasons and all this kind of stuff and i mean for me like yeah certainly seeing 
Naruto be so persistent about it. It wasn't until like toward the end, it's like, okay, I kind of see what, what you're going for. But it's sort of like one of those, like Sasuke didn't have as high of a body count as say Darth Vader. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you want to call the foul on that sort yeah. of redemption. Okay. I get it, but it works thematic. Like, you know, it just, it works emotionally somehow. Yeah. And I think, I think that's, and again, that's the interesting thing that stories like these, the symbol for simplistic in some ways, I mean, not that it doesn't matter what's happening intellectually, but it really matters, can you pull it off emotionally mm, for mm-hmm. a lot of these stories? Especially, I think, the visual medium. I think books, you have a little more, you have to get a little more buy-in intellectually. Yeah. I mean, even if the book is about the interior life of someone, you still have to make those threads connect, Yeah, I think, yeah, in exactly, a way. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's more emotional books and less emotional books, but yeah, it's not, it doesn't, the sound and the visuals don't. Yeah, so sure, sure, sure gets the logic as much. Yeah, there's not a musical cue to tell you how to feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess that's the really interesting thing is that, in some ways, to get your truth across, you have to make the emotions work. Mm. And maybe that's why there's a certain amount where like the audience is going to be receptive; they don't respond to those emotions in the same way you do. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, good empathy with the characters, good kind of truthiness with how people normally act or would you would want them to act plays into you being like, yes, that's a true statement. Yes, that's... That resonates. That resonates, me. yeah. Yeah. From an audience perspective, I think it's also valuable to be able to evaluate that. It's nice to be able to go... We've talked a little bit about emotion and emotionalism yeah. and storytelling. It's nice to be able to go along with that to a certain thing. Yeah. But from a worldview perspective, I think it's also important to be able to kind of hold the line and like, okay, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. I see what you're where you're trying to push me with the story, and I'm not going there. Well, it's interesting because there's sometimes there's stories where you'll be like, you'll be really happy for something. Later on, you're intellectually like, I'm not sure I should have done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Now, as a creator, your goal is to match your intellect and your emotion simultaneously. You want them to feel what you think is true. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, depending on your worldview, you might be like, other people might be like, call, like, no, I don't want those two both to be the same. You know, I don't want. <laughs> I don't know. Another, I guess, theme that I think comes up a lot, can go bad or not, is that whole, like, sorry, cross, like, we're meant for each other. Mm. You know, mm. love wins out. We can be real done really well, and sometimes it can just be like, get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> or like, well, of course, that's going to... Though I'm a sucker for that particular... Oh, or like, like, this love was meant to happen and we'll, sort of we'll, thing? we'll always find you. You know, <laughs> like the Fitz and Simmons. Um, oh, from, sure. From Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. sort of thing. Yeah, that, yeah. We were meant for each other. Nothing's going to stop us. And that's, I don't know. I, I've always resonated with that, but I'm sure it comes off super, can come off very simplistic to people. Yeah, that's, that is interesting. So do you, do you think Fitz and Simmons are lovers that are fated to be together or lovers who will constantly fight fate to be together? I think it works better because you can read both in it. Oh, okay. Well, because if it was simply like, I care nothing for the whole star cross lovers, like, Roman Juliet sort of, uh-huh. or like there's some of the teen angst, angst thing, like, oh, you're going to die. And like, I don't care, you know, <laughs> but I think it's because they chose, you know, they, you want them to be together. They want to be together. They'll mm-hmm. fight whatever they can together. And I guess the universe actually runs against them most of the time in that setting. And yet at the same time, they do manage to get together all the time. And, th- so. and I think, yeah, you could read it either way. Cause they don't really make it. Fate is not an actual present force in shield shield not no, really not not any more than any comic book you sort of thing yeah <laughs> but i think why it appeals to me is one i think in christian worldview love is one of those i could not romantic but love is one of those forces that does win sure i mean that's why i don't know it could be i mean i remember uh interstellar has a really bizarre thing about love being a like a force of nature in okay the, in the universe it's been a long time since yeah, I, 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 I vaguely need to see it again. I but. vaguely remember that being a, a concept in it, it, helping like drive certain factors, which is an interesting idea because like people act based off emotions. So it's, I mean, like the Green Lantern comics mm-hmm. explore that whole idea is like the emotional spectrum, the power of emotions. But we're way we're off way track. Off track. <laughs> okay, so morals. I don't know what are, what are kind of our take home for. We've danced around this a lot. Yeah. Like, it has to do with your receptivity, with the art. We didn't talk a ton about the artistry, but something about just being a good, fair similitude. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do suspect the cliche-ness of a moral can help that feel more simplistic, even if it has some truth to it. I, how many times it's been done recently? And how, right. Yeah. And I guess sometimes, again, simple is good. 
But there, I think there's a level where simple becomes. Go back to the Lord of the Rings example. Obviously, it's not the only thing, or mm-hmm. it's not even. <laughs> there's a million things thematically <laughs> that's more important than that. So, sure, th- I'm not sure you call that simple, but the more you narrow down to just saying one single thing, mm-hmm. I think the less maybe resonant it becomes. That's yeah. That's because a, then you become almost like an Aesop's fable, like oh, it's a true thing, but it yeah. doesn't. I mean, and also the, affect you. The size of the story, you know, makes a big difference there That's too. True. Like Aes- Aesop's fables are designed to be very simple and to the point. They're like flash fictions, practically. Yeah. yeah. But if you have like a two-hour movie that has like just a simple like note to it. I think that's true. I think maybe that's also true. Just even if it's simple, it's got to still fit in with the the depth of your work. Yeah. Or the the weight of your work. I don't mm-hmm. know. I don't know how the best way to put it. I mean, I recently watched the first episode of Kim Possible okay. on, on Disney Plus just out of curiosity. I remember actually being kind of disappointed, like, this is really basic. And then I realized I've really gotten spoiled on these very rich children's shows mm-hmm. between DuckTales and Phineas and Ferb and Avatar The Last Airbender. And even I'd say Miraculous Ladybug, as yeah. strange as that sounds, that, that has not every episode of that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but like, they have a mix of things all the time. And Kim Possible, at least the very first episode... Maybe it got more, but it felt so basic. Like, mm-hmm. okay, she's like a high schooler. Like, everyone knows apparently she goes off on secret missions. Like, how does that work? <laughs> like, the, the world building didn't make any sense to me. So, I mean, again, the fact that I'm looking for more sophistication in the children's show says something yeah. about how when it's done really well, there's a lot going on. And I wonder also if there's – it's also that you have to add your own – I always talk with, and I think I mentioned this before in the podcast, with middle schoolers writing, like, specificity is important. Mm. Like, don't just say, like, just a vague trust your friends. It's not as good as seeing a specific instance of specific friends doing specific things. Sure. And I think the more specific, the more rich the details are, the more the... Because, I mean, I think this is what Pixar will do in some of their best stuff. The thing they're saying is not necessarily something new. Mm. But they say it with such, it's like they unveil it like it's something completely new. Yeah. You know, they... Or at least the best picks are. Yeah. And, and again, they unveil it. You come to it. It's not like you start at the beginning like, I know what the theme of this thing is. Yeah. Yeah. Wally is a great example of that. Mm-hmm. Like the trailers kind of pointed out like, okay, he's a robot on a trash planet. And he's going to go off on an adventure. Okay, cool. But what it doesn't tell you that that it's going to be a movie about connection. And it's going to be a movie about the wonder of the universe mm-hmm. and the wonder of life and of truly living and not just being a, a, a blob adult. on a chair moving <laughs> yeah, around. Yeah, a grown-up baby, essentially. Yeah. You don't know that's what the movie is going to be about until you get into it. It's You get to explore that as the movie goes on. And maybe and, it's that, that since you're exploring, like, I think the worst thing you do for, if you want your message to make sense or you're you know have this moral is to assume that everyone already understands it mm, yeah no, that's a very good i think presenting it like it's something new and that you yourself have been impacted by it makes it okay it's kind of like sermons mm. in this say I, I remember hearing a pastor once that like before he could preach a good sermon it had to sink in and affect him first okay and you can tell the difference i think between stories that the writer really thinks no, friendship saves us. And people were like, this is a good thing to do. Let's add it in because... It'll make people feel good. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fair point. I think it's got to be something that you come, you, you present as if it's... Bra- because again, when we have revelations, and sometimes you tell someone, someone's like, yeah, I always knew that. Um, <laughs> yep. But but if you can communicate that newness that came to you with, and again, there's a lot of old stuff we will come back to again and again. We'll be like, oh yeah, friends do matter. Oh yeah, love is good. Or oh yeah, whatever the... I think the more you can come to it as a creator fresh and more as a as a viewer or a reader that it is presenting to you like it's a a real thing not just an add on not just a bow mm-hmm. I think the more it becomes this simple truth that matters and it is fascinating to think that it does feel like that it comes out through best as a discovery as an exploration I mean which is how we come to understand truths in in real life mm-hmm. like you could have a teacher just tell you in Sunday school, God loves you. Yeah. Jesus, loves, like, this is what a miracle is. and all. But, like, un- unless you experience that for yourself, it's just going to be data. I mean, I think sermons and, like, just say, God loves you. It's something like, I work at a Christian school. You say it a lot. <laughs> but my thing has always been, like, but we can't 
you hear it and then it doesn't mean it stops meaning anything mm. so like when i used to write christmas plays my goal every time was to say okay this christmas story everyone knows how do i say the same story in a way that looks like it's new yeah because we get so easily if we've heard it before we just assume we know it but knowing it in your head and knowing it relationally or emotionally is completely different yeah art can help us remember what things mean. Yeah. It was fascinating to me in our small group book that we had a chapter about Tanner, Henry yeah. Henry Tanner, I think, who was an, an artist from uh, turn of the century, turn 20th century. Yeah, I think I so. Right. That sounds right. He wound up doing a lot of biblical paintings. What was fascinating to me about that is we had previously read about another painter, Caravaggio, from the 1600s, yeah. who was doing the same thing, not artistic style necessarily, but they were both trying to make biblical scenes come alive. Come again. alive. Like, like they had a new, fresh perspective on it, a new thing to it. Art is constantly re-showing us things we already know and yet making it feel new. All the great literature is basically saying the same thing over again, but in very, here it is, here's new again, and also in very specific modes that are different from each other yeah I feel like even that case Caravaggio did it all in basically Renaissance Italian backdrops meanwhile Tanner went to Israel and like hey here's how it actually looks <laughs> <laughs> again right, that right. mattered when he was around when Caravaggio was doing it they didn't care they just wanted to see real people mm -hmm. interacting with the biblical things yeah yeah that's why art is so challenging to make because there are bullet points that like here's how you frame a story here's yeah. a structure here's the stuff but it's at the same time it's not a step-by-step -step process no. like every single work of art is like starting from scratch all over again every single time you're going on a new journey of trying to find trying to shape this thing to what you're trying to explore and describe and and illuminates new th things well illuminate the old things in new ways new, and i guess i guess uh, encouragement to creators with these simple you know we talk about these simple morals you're like well i want to do something complex the simple ones are what i mean you can do complex ones there's nothing wrong with that but we need them said over and over again it's okay <laughs> if someone said it before yeah like there's no like oh no victor hugo said something about you know <laughs> Love, conquer, you know, mm -hmm. sacrifice, sacrificial love. Yeah, okay, that's fine. You can do it again. Yeah. Like, we yeah, need the, it over and over again. And, we're, we're dumb. <laughs> <laughs> and usually, as simple as these things are, there's usually great depth to them, mm -hmm. meaning that, like, even if you're going to a familiar well, you can still dig that well a little deeper. Anything that helps with it sinking deeper into you, too. Yeah. Like, if you just do the surface level stuff, it's not much better than just hearing it one more time. Mm hmm. So, yeah. That, man, that conversation went places I was not expecting, but I, I really like it. <laughs> All right. Well, good. Well, I think we'll, we'll wrap that up there and head off to Soundtrack. All right. So, for my Soundtrack today, I wanted to pick a song that was relatively simple in the sense of instrumentation. I just felt like that would make sense with what we're but also just beautiful or impactful or whatever. So I looked at some piano solos and stuff, but then I remembered there was a whole remix album of Seventh Saga, a game I never played, um, remixed by Arrow Z. His name's Sebastian something or other. But uh, Arrow Z is his screen name, apparently. Yes, but his real name's Sebastian Frege. Okay. There we go. Sure. Anyways, he plays the cello, and he all these songs he remixed with three cellos, his cello, played over top of each other. Like, he'll play a thing, and then okay. he'll record it, and he'll put it over top of each other. So it's very beautiful, very rhythmic. And it's also got stuck in my head because it, I used to play a lot when Mercy was first born, and the other kids were going to bed. They wanted some music, and I just played this, I guess. Um, so, like, as I hear, I'm flashback to, <laughs> like, Baby Mercy and that stuff. So, anyways, this is called just number two, Water. It's the second of seven he did seven songs for Seventh Saga. Okay. So enjoy.
Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that um, very classical sounding piece. It was lovely. And next up is Once Upon a Scene. If for some reason you're new, welcome. Hi. This is the part where we play a scene from some sort of story. And then we let you guys email us or contact us or pigeon us. Is, <laughs> Carrier is pigeon? Yeah. <laughs> um, what is? But let's go ahead. Last month we had one. I don't think we had any entries for we this had, one. Yeah, we had no, no guesses, but you can still guess. You're not too late. You can, well, guess to yourself. After right you. before we tell you the answer. Yes. Or <laughs> time travel. But just as a, at least as a reminder, here is last month's sound. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute, I tell you. You ain't heard nothing. You want to hear Tootsie Tootsie? Twit, twit, All right. Hold on. Hold on. All right, Tim, so I would not have recognized this one, but you, I think, would have. So what is this? This is from the very first, well, at least the first successful full-length motion picture with sound, The Jazz Singer from 1927. Very nice, which makes sense in our, that was from our episode with, about public domain, and they had just entered the public domain. That's so correct. That made sense. That's correct. It's a very historical movie. Which I have not seen yet. It's not high priority. Funnily enough, I talked about the jazz singer back, I think, in our very first episode of yeah, this you, podcast. Yeah, you did. I've known about it since then. <laughs> For 13 years, yep, almost. Almost. All right. Anyways, <laughs> we have another sound clip for you today from a story. It could be from anywhere. Could be anything. So it could be anything. So, Tim, play us this sound clip. Okay. I hate sauerkraut. All right. Well, yeah, there it is. There it is. I think these are getting shorter. Yeah. Uh, just so you know, this is not The Stranger. <laughs> <laughs> just not, so, I just had to throw it out there. Um, it's not The Prisoner, although you never know. It could have been <laughs> could The Prisoner. Have been the prisoner. <laughs> Honestly, I would not have put past The Prisoner to have an episode that has had that. <laughs> you know, that's some weird experimentation rooms. Yeah. Are uh, they saying them bones? I mean, them they bones, could just... They could, uh, they'd do anything. They could do anything. All right. Except to have an American accent. Whoa, okay, except there was one episode of this. They tried. They tried. Okay, (laughs) anyways, if you know the answer for what story that came from, email us at dearoldtrains at gmail.com. Contact us on the different social media platforms, mainly Twitter and Facebook, or go to to the website and... Give it to a code, or, or, we, or we can see it. If you're the first one to comment, say first, and we'll, we'll yeah, we'll, we're good. <laughs> just, just say first. Just saying first <laughs> will mean they, they got it correct. Exactly. That, yep. doesn't, that doesn't work. Okay. Oh, we'll see. Anyways, um, and the website is, Tim. DerailedTrainsOfThoughts.com. All right. For our second half, then, we are going to... What if? Yeah. 
So, what if is where we basically storytell with usually some sort of bizarre um, what if. Some sort of interesting prompts. And today we've got our hats out Yay, again. Yay, we have our hats. It's been so a while since we What if we, we wore hats <laughs> <laughs> on the podcast? Would anyone know? No, they wouldn't. They'd... I'm wearing a hat right now. No, I'm not. Uh, no, you're not. <laughs> but you wouldn't be able to tell. You are wearing a tutu, which is very strange. It, it is. It's the, how the podcast did it. <laughs> so anyways, um, you're wearing Crocs. I don't have a problem with Crocs. I don't know. I don't either. <laughs> I don't understand why people hate them so much, or some people do. Anyways, today what we decided to do, we put in some movies, theoretically bad movies, as you wanted to find. Bad could be like it was legitimately like Rift Tracks bad. It could be just like, uh, it's we'd like to make fun of it. Whatever. All right. <laughs> I can only guess what you put in there. Um, I have some that will probably make you laugh. Okay. <laughs> Mine were not as... Anyway, we'll see. And then we put in morals. Theoretically, morals that could show up in a movie. I have shown up in a movie. I have shown up sometimes well, sometimes badly. Yep. And I think our idea is to, assuming the movie doesn't already have this moral, <laughs> to change the movie script, one, to be a better movie, maybe. Hopefully. Or book. I think there's one or two books in here. Oh, okay. Oh, I just want uh, movies. So I guess I, I kind of should. I, 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 had, I had a wild card one. That I'm like, oh, I'll just throw that in here. No okay. one understand it. You've already made your obligatory The Stranger reference. I, I have to. I get paid <laughs> by Camus. Is he alive? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But it's absurd. Um, <laughs> anyway. So let's, we do do, let's do this. Let's do this. Do I have the movies or do the, I yes, the movies? Yeah, start with the movie. Yeah, you get the movie. So let's give us give us a movie first. Uh, okay, here we go. Gangs of New York. <laughs> okay, so Nathan, we, we, we got we got to summarize this. Yeah, for, Nathan the other day said that at our small group that that's becoming one of our uh, bingo cards. <laughs> well, he didn't say bingo card, but it's like one of our. We'll make fun about of that as much minutes. Well, you know, it's it's hard not to make references to it. Like I don't know. I think when I was referencing, it was something like from that time period. It's like there were very few stories that I know that are from that period. To, like, well, and it's just one of those movies that like it tries to be good, but like. And it is. It is in lots of ways. Yeah. But we, we have a particular beef against, beef it. against it. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to hear more, you can listen to our episode of Let's Finally Watch This, where we covered it. So apologies to Martin Scorsese, but yes. we we're going to re- rewrite your film about gangs fighting in New York about stuff. Stuff. <laughs> because, because they're gangs. Yeah. Yeah. With um, the moral, nuclear war is bad. <laughs> So just as you all know, Gangs of New York takes place during the Civil War. <laughs> so this is going to be fun. <laughs> Nuclear war is bad. I like that moral. I mean, it's... It is. It, well, it is, yes. And it's strangely fitting. I mean, like, this is a... Weird thing about Gangs of New York is you're never 100% certain about whether the violence, you're supposed to, like, exult in the violence or not. Yeah. So the real trick is how do they get get nuclear weapons? <laughs> Well, apparently, uh, who's the main character there? Um, someone the Butcher. Harry the Butcher? No. Um, What's his first name? It's been several months yeah, now. Yeah, I don't remember. We were just calling the Butcher. The, bu- the Butcher guy. He, he, he's in charge of this basically slum area of he's New York. He's a slum lord, yeah. Yeah. And he just rules the politics of it and everything. Mm. Yeah. And our Leonardo DiCaprio wants to... It's a revenge story against him, basically. Yeah, wants to take him out. So, again, there's going to be fighting, and they fight with basically just knives and stuff. Axes. Axes and, and sharp instruments. Not even guns, really, do no, they? No, just household stuff, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I feel like it needs to be one of these escalating wars. Right, right. Like, he kills him with, he kills someone on his side with a knife, and then he get, brings a gun, and then he brings a cannon. <laughs> All right? But the trick is, how do we get the nuclear bomb there? I mean, the question is, do you go, like, literally, like, they get a physicist to work on a super weapon for it? Or are we going more allegorical? Like, what's that Dr. Seuss story with the, like, snitches? Oh, yeah. The butter side down or whatever? Yeah. I well, what that's I mean, for realism's sake, you know, I, allegorical for fun <laughs> you, get, <laughs> you get actual physics or time travel <laughs> oh wow so there's an island no <laughs> <laughs> i'm not sure where to go with this honestly um uh, okay say we do it allegorical because it it takes the least amount of um completely skewering destroying the, the genre yeah. okay we would have to destroy the entire movie make a whole make it a sci-fi so, okay, let's say the butcher kills Leo Cartonario DiCaprio's dad. dad with a knife or uh-huh. an axe or some sort of instrument. So I guess then there needs to be some sort of bigger knife mm-hmm. used yeah. again. And then it goes to an axe. An axe, okay. And then 
I mean, so far this is very sounding very well. I mean, this is basically gangs, gangs of New York. York. Yeah, they keep <laughs> killing each other back and forth for a little while. But um, okay, and then we need to go to like a, a, gun, a gun. Yeah, well, yeah goes go to a gun, gun first, first, and then sure. and then like a rifle. Okay, we're, mm-hmm. we're just going to do lots. It's a very violent movie, guys. Okay, <laughs> we're going to up the violence. Okay, way up the violence, and that's saying so, something. So you go from a rifle to is like a. Well, maybe like a, what's the like a little swivel gun thing? Oh, like not like a full cannon, but like didn't they have like chain shot or something like that? Maybe they did. Okay, we'll, we'll assume. Yeah, why not? Sure, why not? It doesn't be completely. And then cannon. And then what do we do from there? Multiple cannons, bombs. I think then what they do is they bring in a battalion of the Yankee Army. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just decimate the whole the entire <laughs> like like Lincoln shows up with like part of the <laughs> army. <laughs> <laughs> okay, make it a little more realistic. Make it Grant. Okay, at okay. Least he's Grant. <laughs> <laughs> no, that'd be great because it's a war, all right? So we have Grant on one side, and then we get Lee on the other. They come into New York City. Okay, here's the problem with this, though. Like, Bill the Butcher. Bill, that's what his name okay. was. Bill the Butcher. <laughs> He claims to be a Yankee, so he'd get the Yankees. Yeah, so I mean, but like he's also the bad guy. So would the would <laughs> would would the Yankees actually go with him, the Slumlord, or would like you're thinking too hard about this? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, here's the here's the thing. He gets the Yankees come with him. Okay, okay. Then Grant realizes he's he's a maniac. Okay, he's psychopathic. Okay. okay. So he just decides to and level then they destroy the entire, everything. It's just it's just the whole the whole. They nuked the whole place, okay? So oh, wait, no, so just the neighborhood or like the whole island of Manhattan? So it starts, Grant does the neighborhood. Okay. Which is what was it called? Uh, five points. Yeah. I think All right. I remember right. <laughs> and then, okay, and then the movie has this whole labor, this whole revolt, right? Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. it starts that off and just spreads and just demolishes all New York. Not the Yankee Army, they're just okay. yeah, all, yeah. The, all the immigrants and then maybe... Some of the other people come up, and yeah, just by the end, it's just a burning wreckage. Like, New York is just, it's like the Chicago fire just went through. Yeah, okay? I mean, this really does bring a new meaning to the Manhattan Project. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, and so so really, it's just as violent as the original movie. Pretty much. We might have we might have less other problems. But. <laughs> That's true. There's no time for uh, the, the nudity stuff no, when, when, no. when I, you're just blowing each other I'm up. I'm sure you could find a way if you wanted to, but yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, Gang of New York. Okay. All well, right. Nuclear war is bad. Yes. You should know that by now. <laughs> All right. Here we go. <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, at the end when they do the whole thing, then it would be like Tokyo in 19... 19- 40, whatever, and that'll be like the, the history repeats, history repeats itself. itself. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. that makes sense. Vertigo, the hmm. movie's Vertigo. You can guess who put that one uh, in. Yeah, you did. <laughs> that was something I would have put, but. All right, and the moral is, the truth wins out. The truth wins out, which is actually kind of a thing for Vertigo, isn't it? It kind of is, yeah. I mean, he does find the truth, Jimmy Stewart. Okay, folks, the reason I don't like Vertigo <laughs> I've probably talked about this before. It's been a while, but like it's a very unsatisfying movie, in my opinion. Jimmy Stewart figures things out way after the audience does, and then the one of the main characters gets killed by being scared by a nun and just falls off a roof. It's very anticlimactic, yeah. in my opinion. Not as much as the birds, though. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But yeah, he does find out that this lady has been lying to her. So should we go with something else? Yeah, that, that, one... that kind of happens in the movie. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So we got to have something else. Okay, Vertigo with the power of family. The power of family. So, um, so Jimmy Stewart has a son. No. <laughs> <laughs> he has a son, and I feel like he needs a posse. I'm I'm picturing this like Vertigo meets Fast, Fast and the Furious. Furious. I was going to say, okay, Fast and Furious. Okay, like, so Jimmy okay, Stewart so, meets Vin Diesel, and so he's got this posse of people that are going to help him solve this murder. Okay, so so we got Jimmy Stewart. Mm-hmm. We have his best friend, um, who they met uh, in. The war. Police Academy. Oh, Police Academy. Because okay. I think he's a detective, I think if I remember okay. right. Police Academy. Okay, is he built like Vin Diesel? Sure, this why not? Fun because, because Jimmy Stewart is not. <laughs> no. <he's> a, <laughs> so like they're kind of an odd couple. Okay, like okay. The, I like the, that. The buff dude and the, and the stick. Okay, okay, I like that. And But they, they but, care of each other. They, they went through the Academy together, together. So, okay. so they're brothers, man. They're brothers. They're brothers. Right. I think someone needs a cousin. Okay. From like, where does Virgo take place? Is that in California? I think so. Like San Francisco. Okay, or let's something. have someone from out east. He's visiting, you know, just, okay, from Boston. So he has the whole like wicked accent. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's good. And and um, he, he and he uh, always wears. I mean, he's always working on cars. No. Oh, never mind. 
<laughs> He's a baseball fanatic. He carries gotta, a bat around with him. <laughs> I got to remember the, the story of Vertigo now. I don't I just, remember enough of it, honestly. <laughs> I remember scenes, but not the story. So Jimmy Stewart suffers from Vertigo. He's got this fear of heights thing. But then there's also the story about this woman that he's following. And then and she's he, he is caught up in a mystery. And she winds up dying. And he's haunted by this. And then he sees some other woman that reminds him of her, except it turns out it actually is her, but he doesn't know about it right away. So I feel like that whole subplot takes place while he and his brother are trying to provide for their racing business. Okay. The side business. Side business. Okay. And, so- and, and Jimmy Stewart keeps getting distracted by this stupid woman. Okay. And they keep talking to him like, hey, just get your head on straight. and Yeah. And, the, and maybe maybe they keep taking him up to like high places, trying to get him over his vertigo. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And you know, you know, it seems much more of a comedy at this point. But it kind of does. I mean, I I would say the 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 woman, the Ava character. I think her name. Is, I don't remember if that's the character's name or the actress's name. Anyway, she, does she have her own posse? Basically, she's trying to worm her way into like she's she's not the innocent. A uh, one who, who got kind of got conned into the scheme. She's more like the. Uh, it's like, yeah, I'm gonna break up this family. We're gonna because I've got my own my own posse. That's uh, okay. Yeah. So they're gangs of San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Yeah, I don't know the story as well as no. I as hoped. So, I, but I like the idea of fusing uh, Vertigo and Fast and Furious. I, I think that's good. I think that'd be interesting. It'd be interesting. No, yes. no. Here's the thing: it's not cars. They race planes. Oh, because okay. then the Vertigo comes into play constantly. Oh, okay. Like he's the only one in the whole posse that doesn't like to fly. It's oh, Mister T. Okay. No, um, but like to save his family, he learns how to get over his fear of flying, yeah, and, and he, yeah. he sees through the the woman's like machinations. Like, mm-hmm. no, you're not going to get between me and my family. Yep. So basically, the title remains, and the story disappears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we skewer that one pretty much. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. I think that worked. Okay. What's our next movie, Nick? Next movie is. Wow, Tim. Wow. Roller Gator. <laughs> we were just talking this about this. This is not a movie. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, if you've never seen Roller Gator, good job. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... What is it about, honestly? Uh, There's a puppet that's well, a gator. That's an alligator that talks. And, and the this... Uh, He's, he's supposed to be the mascot for an amusement park. And he escapes. And he, he escapes. And, and his girl, he just wants to hang around with his girl. Yeah. So the uh, amusement park owners send a surf ninja yep. and slash skate ninja. There's also the... Um, to retrieve him. Uh, the swamp farmer guy who's looking for a roller gator. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember. Did the roller gator I must come get from kidnapped. him? No. Oh, did they, the amusement park owners kidnap the gator from... Or wanted to? I don't remember. I don't remember now. I mean, the main thing I remember... Really... My memories of that is drowned out by the soundtrack of someone <laughs> constantly strumming a guitar that, without just, any melody. And and honestly, that fight scene just completely overwhelmed everything else in the show. <laughs> World so, worst so, fight scene. so those are the ingredients. Ingredients, And yes. we'll try to, put, to add this moral to all that. The moral being, love requires sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Roller Gator finds a girl, right? Mm-hmm. Or a girl finds him. I don't really remember. And he just wisecracks and... I probably should have picked movies that we knew better. What? There's nothing to know with this movie. <laughs> but that is literally the entire plot for an hour and a half. Uh, um, probably, I've probably blocked most memories of this movie from my yeah. mind, to well, be honest. Well, I feel like... Well, first off, the girl has to like the Roller Gator. So they which lock. is a tall order. It's a tall order anyways. <laughs> It's not hard for anyone to like a roller gator. <laughs> I mean, the the creature. So, so the, you're saying? Oh, I'm working towards it. At some point, the girl will have to sacrifice and or die for roller gator to get free to protect roller gator from the evil business. So I suppose man. it'd be more satisfying for the viewer if roller gator died. <laughs> 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 I mean, I can see that. Like he he throws himself in front of the surf ninja who cuts him down and protects the the girl, and she's like, "Oh, phew, thank goodness!" They, <laughs> and, they, and leaves for being safer for having no more roller gator. For having no more roller gator in her backpack. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's me. I'm. I don't know how much that really gets the point across. The problem with the roller gator, we need to have a a deep. If the moral is going to be legit, if we're going to discover it again, yeah, we're going to need to. We actually have to make roller gator likable. Or maybe, maybe we know he's not likable, but she likes him anyways. That she has a Beauty and the Beast sort of thing okay. with him. She so sees past, like maybe he's he has this front of wisecracking, even though none of his jokes are funny. No, and she knows he's trying to hide his deep hurts. His deep hurt, yeah. 
his deep longing to return to the swamp and his swamp farmer friend. Yes, yes, who he had a feud with, and she knows that he needs to go make it right. So she throws herself in front of the surf ninja uh-huh. and get beaten down, and she uh, maybe she also really needs some money. She could have sold Roller Gator. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. The arcade, through the arcade... To the, 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 the fair guy. Yeah, the amusement park the, owner. The Estevez. Yeah. <laughs> brother. Yeah. Emilio I'm, Estevez's brother. I, don't, I can't remember his yeah. name right now. I'm still not feeling the love is sacrificial. No. We're going to really play up roller game. He's going to be much more either pathetic or likable. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> is there, I'm not sure there's much saving in this movie. I don't think, yeah. I think it's time to let's okay, move on. Move okay. on. <laughs> All right, let's see. What's this one? This is my wild card. Okay. Court of the Air. Oh, interesting. We'll this have to is, explain a little bit. This is one of our book club books. Yeah. Uh, very Wait, elaborate steampunk novel. Again, not a bad novel, but we have a, it has very distinct deficiencies. Yeah. We'll probably go into some of that more here, but certainly yeah. when we get to a book club discussion. Okay, so I've got two here. Okay. One is the one we we heard earlier, uh, the, the truth wins out. Okay. Or we do forgiveness is powerful. Let's do forgiveness. Okay. Yeah. It's very hard to summarize Core of the Air, but in a nutshell, it's a world. It's a world. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a world where there's um, mad ancient gods coming back to life to devour human souls and destroy all things. Mm-hmm. And a girl and a boy with supernatural powers basically standing their way. I mean, that's a very simplistic. And it helped along the way by steam men. Yeah. Uh, kind of steam powered robots. Yes. That are religious in some weird way. Yeah. And there's fey things going around. Like, and, and more stuff. But and more yeah, stuff, it, but yes. Okay, so here's the thing. Forgiveness is powerful that we said? Yes. So what do we what do we do? Who are we forgiving? Because there's a lot of characters in this book, and a lot of them they have Sorted past a lot of them. Mm-hmm. You know what I think would be interesting. You know, there's there's a subplot about some of the. So we you talk about like the ancient evil gods. Yeah, but there's also like the, these fey beings. I'm always like, kind of like just want to wipe out the world and start over. Sort well, of well, there's the one guy who the does, bear. but the, yeah. But then there's also the one that the woman, like I guess, oh the, yeah, the main boy's mother, mother or, or it's something. Vague. Yeah. It's it's confusing. But like, I think there could be a very interesting story about. So the, the yeah the fey god is fine with wiping humanity in order to basically get rid of the gods themselves. Yeah, like. you get rid of the, you get rid of the bad by sweeping everyone away. Yeah, so it could be very interesting of like uh, nuclear nuclear bombs are bad. <laughs> <laughs> nuclear war is bad. Yes, it'd be interesting to focus the forgiveness storyline on him. Like if he actually was willing to extend forgiveness to humanity. In, oh, in, okay. And in that sense, rather than having this all-out violent conflict against these evil demon things, okay, if the the act of forgiveness just sapped them of their power, okay, that would be that would be interesting. And I think the, it's a big enough book. You could actually throw it different layers. You could have some of the um, the prince who you know is going to have his oh yeah arms cut off. Uh-huh. It's, it's a thing because they hate kings. Yeah, but you know if he could forgive some of the. The people who want to do it to him, or mm. you know, there's a lot of ten- there's a lot of people tense. Like there's the the Democrats and the communists. That's not what they're called. <laughs> um, but you know, there's a lot of that sort of thing that we could have some reconciliation. Mean, there's really not any reconciliation in the no, book. No, this book does not have very much grace in it at all. So that'd be a really interesting. I think you could argue it might make it a at least for us a a more uh, resonant book. Mo oh, for if sure done that. For sure. I mean, like the idea of our world is hugely fallen, but like the power of forgiveness would, if it could cleanse all that. Yeah. I mean, it it feels very Christian in the sense of of like, we live in a fallen world, our world is messed up, but the power of the cross and salvation is radically life-changing. I like that. I That's a nice pairing. I don't think we'll get more detail, but it'll get yeah. complicated. The book's, com- there's a lot of really neat stuff in the book, but. It's dense. It's dense. Yes. Yes. Okay. Nice. You want to try one more? Let's do one more. Okay. I almost put this one. Starship Troopers. Yeah, that was a last minute I inspiration. I saw that live in theaters, not with Rift Tracks. I'm so sorry. I probably said this one. That was one of my worst movie experiences in Battlefield Earth. Ugh, yeah. My dad and I went to sci-fi movies. There wasn't anything. We're like, we'll go see sci-fi. And it wasn't always great. No, it's yeah. a very, there's kind of a theme here. Like That one is overly violent, more than it needs to be. I mean, 
it's just kind of the way that director does things, yeah. I think. But like, so what? What's our theme for Starship Troopers? Life is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> that is wonderful. I mean, um, so Starship Troopers is this yeah sci fi thing where they're killing bugs at, basically. Yeah, humanity is at war with alien bugs, like giant alien bugs who will like stab and rip people apart. Now, I'm not to be fair. I've not read the book. Nathan Marsh and our friend has, and he is apparently a really good book. Mm. By uh, Robert A. Hyland. Yeah. Um, but the movie did not work for me. It has a much more satirical edge, I think. It's trying to be, but in a very R-rated, yeah. violent kind of way. So this is another one I like to rip it apart because I didn't like it much. But I don't know that I remember a whole lot of the plot to it. Well, okay, so there's I probably mentioned on here before, too, there's a Ray Bradbury story. I forget what it's called, but it's from the point of view of, the, of these aliens. They're beautiful. They love singing and all this stuff. But to humans, they look like giant spiders. And the humans are just scared to death. I think. Oh yeah, you might mention that last time because <laughs> we had a Ray Rabbit. I don't story. think we mentioned last. But I've mentioned it before. But okay. I don't think. Anyways, but I wonder if we do something like that where we're killing them out of fear and misunderstanding. I mean, this sounds very much like a science fiction, mm. and we'll completely destroy the plot. Or maybe there's a a subsection of them that's they have an art and a culture. Okay. So you are wrestling like they have this entire civilization, but they're bloodthirsty bugs. How do we reconcile the the ah, life, I see. the life aspect of they have created beautiful things, and if they've created beautiful things, they can't be completely evil. Mm. Maybe you could add that aspect. I don't. Then becomes much more morally complex. It does very complex. The trick I always find with that sort of thing, and they they play with that a little bit in Doctor Who. Yeah, but I'm always like, like on the one hand, I kind of understand it, but on the other hand, I'm also kind of like, but good things should be beautiful. I don't know. It it's weird. Like I. Well, I'm saying that we find even humans find things about their culture that's beautiful, but they themselves are in this bloodthirsty. Yeah, bloodthirsty, bloodthirsty form. So how do how do you help them reconnect to their beautiful past so that they so recognize that they, life? Okay, so you're not saying that like we should respect how they're how bloodthirsty they are. They, no, 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 no. Okay, okay. I, I'm saying. saying that and they're two sided too. Okay, okay. And so how do we how do we bridge to the maybe, maybe the side they forgot? Maybe they've devolved or, or yeah or become nihilistic or i don't know what maybe maybe the the trick is somehow having a a sharing of some form of art like maybe music like they mm. they both have this love of beautiful music and so like the human armies start realizing that and start playing it wherever it they like can there, was there a crusade episode well, I'm also music. I, in Babylon Five. You know, there's that story that Veer tells about Londo hearing the Pakmara singing. Oh. I think that's partly where the idea came yeah. from. But I think art is a way. I mean, that's why we have this podcast. Yeah, that that's art true. is a way to say life is beautiful. Yeah. So, all right, we'll go with that. Or another way, you could always say they're just bloodthirsty race. But then maybe one or two of them. May we, we inter- I mean, this view. You know, now in today's culture, might be like this is imperialist. But we introduce culture to them, mm. like art, and they're like opens up a, an aspect of life they've never. Oh, they never thought about. They never before. had to. Yeah, That'd be an, I don't know how sentient those bugs are, honestly. Yeah, I don't know. They may just be creatures. Yeah, uh, and that's I, a whole different thing. I don't remember. Well, then you just have PETA come in and say you can't kill these things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if they're ghastly, I guess that's the part like I can't quite figure out how to do it. If like they are legitimately grotesque bugs, I mean. There are some bugs that are like hugely ugly that like no one that's some people will find attractive and other people won't. But yeah. there are some that like, how could anyone find this attractive? Yeah. And I'd be like, well, that's just because of the fall. Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> like, true. Like, you know, it's different matter. Maybe we just raise some baby insects and they become better. <laughs> they, <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. There's options. Yeah, there. there's options there. Right. Yeah, we should probably wrap this up, but okay. I, I, it would be kind of fun to give our audience a couple other options if they want to play this at home. Okay. okay. <laughs> so here's our, I got two left and you got two left, I think. I do, yeah. Okay, so one of them is, oh, you put Gangs of New York as well. Oh, yes, I did. I oh. thought you had read mine earlier. Nope, I, that was mine. <laughs> so we both thought of Gangs of oh, New York. Oh, wow, wow, damn. That's funny. Well, you know what? I see you had one that was similar to mine where it's like family sticks so together. So we both had that, okay. We both had a family thing. So okay, then the last one then, I guess for you audience, here's what you do. You'll take the Super Mario Brothers, the original live oh, action Oh, live action. One. Yep. Okay. With the moral, we should respect other people's cultures. <laughs> <laughs> that fits perfect there. <laughs> All right, guys. That's we, a very strange culture. So. Yes, yes. Go for it. Have All fun. right, so Super Mario Brothers respecting the Mushroom Kingdom. With Koopa. And the, the, and the Goombas. And the, the Blade Runner-inspired Mushroom Kingdom. 
for some so weird, weird reason. So weird. Anyways, so that's our what if. Hopefully, it has been somewhat entertaining, enlightening, or um, baffling. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what if usually is all those things. <laughs> But we're ready to go order something. Yes. So um, maybe some pancakes. Pancakes? That sounds good. Let's do yeah. some pancakes. Okay. So before we get out of here, Tim, I think you have a, a soundtrack. Yes. I do also want to remind people, we mentioned this earlier about our website, deroldtrainsofthought.com. Oh, yeah. Please let us know if you're listening. If we've not heard from you, would you like to have you check in? Be like, hey, yeah. Say listening. hi. This is good. Yeah. I got to hear from one of, speaking of Nathan, we name dropped him a couple of times today, but one of his listeners, he had a Rift Tracks game thing and oh, yeah. one, one of his one of the people who was playing along said hey i listened to Duro trains so i don't remember your name sir but thanks for saying hi nice very good yeah okay so my, my soundtrack today you know it's been over six months since, since i had a kingdom hearts title <laughs> wow tim you're you, never I, I was trying to do an on the right wagon off the wagon sort of joke, <laughs> but yeah. we mentioned how kingdom hearts has some some things that are some simple, simple and clean. I actually thought of that one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was like, okay, I'll go with this. And I'm going to pick one from Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep. Um, this is a remix called Sleeping Beauty Makes a Horrible Nightmare. <laughs> and it's a remix of the Sleeping Beauty world uh, okay. known in Kingdom Hearts as Enchanted Dominion. Which, you know, fairy tales are a good example of good, simple. Like, yeah. They have a good, simple story. In yeah. Them. I would agree with that. So anyway, this is by Never Back Music. It's nice cinematic. And uh, it's not very many Kingdom Hearts remixes I find that are actually on the uh, the Disney world. So mm-hmm. I appreciate this one. Uh, and I hope you enjoy it as well. All right. I guess then, um, yeah, just stop by our website. Say hi. Listen to our sister podcast. Weekly Hijack just got over recently. Yeah. Just we have finished. not watched The Prisoner. Watch The Prisoner, guys. Yes. Watch The Prisoner for, for sure. And then... Um, Soon we'll have let's finally watch this season one two. So we've not listened to season one. That's right. I yeah. would highly recommend it. It was, it was a lot of good movies there. That's right. And we walk through the decades of the twentieth century, talking about uh, a lot of not, well, not all the decades. The ones we missed, we cover. We'll be covering this season. Mm-hmm. But good stuff, good conversation, and uh, the new season, season two, we should be starting early to mid September. All right. I guess this has been Nick, and this is Tim. Adios. Bye bye. <laughs>